As landscape photographers, we're often out in the middle of nowhere in complete darkness, so it may not be long before you fall in love with the night sky. Nightscapes are a stunning photography genre that combine landscapes with astrophotography. It's a really natural way to broaden your shoot options and portfolio, but it's one of the most technically challenging genres of photography. Astrophotography literally pushes everything about your camera to the limit. So with all the technical and workflow challenges, there is plenty of room to ruin a three hour astro shoot. And since I started experimenting with nightscapes the last couple of years, I've made tons of newbie mistakes. I've made so many that I'm gonna split this up into a two part vlog series. In today's episode, we'll focus on five technical issues and analyze them in the style of a retrospective. And then in part two, we'll come back and focus on workflow and shoot mistakes that have less to do with your camera and more to do with, well, everything else. So here are five newbie astrophotography mistakes to watch out for when you get out there to start shooting your own nightscapes. The first newbie mistake to watch out for is shooting with a dirty lens. Now, I'm no slob, but when I shot this image of the Portland Bell Lighthouse, it wasn't until I started looking at these images that I saw just how much bokeh there was. So when I zoom in on this, you'll see all these circles around the lighthouse, and I couldn't figure out what was up with that. I was shooting with my lens wide open at f4, which unfortunately is as wide as it gets, but I couldn't figure out what all these circles were. I clean my lenses all the time, so I didn't even think about that being the issue. But just to see, I whipped out my microfiber cloth, which I always keep in my jacket pocket, and started to wipe it down a little bit. I did it for a couple minutes, and the very next shot looks like this. Wow, that's a, so much cleaner and a lot fewer bokeh. Now there are still bokeh on, here on the edge, and then there's this strong bokeh here, but I think that's just lens flare. So I tried giving it another cleaning. This time I spent several minutes trying to clean it, and I got this result. It looks so much better compared to what we had before. You would think that I'm negligent and that I never clean my lens, but no, I actually clean my lens quite frequently. But because of the extreme contrast, especially when you incorporate artificial light sources into your image, that extreme contrast is not lens flare, that's just little bits of oils from your fingers from accidentally touching the lens, or if you're using a microfiber cloth that's you've used quite a few times, it might actually be depositing oils on your lens. So you make sure to clean it before the shoot under a bright light source, and then don't forget to clean it when you're at the shoot and you've already set up as well. Because especially if you're shooting near the sea, just the tiniest bit of salt spray on the lens could show up as bokeh. So you wanna make sure to clean it before the shoot and after. And when you're out in the field, turn on your headlamp and put it at an angle to the lens. That way you can tell if you've got it immaculately clean. Even the slightest bit of oil on the lens, maybe even just deposited from a reused microfiber cloth is going to show up here. The second newbie mistake to watch out for is shooting at too high of an ISO. Now this is a really counterintuitive one. Normally we use the ISO setting on a camera to cut down on the amount of noise we get when we go to do post-production. For example, when shooting the night sky, it's so incredibly dark out that we would be tempted to shoot at a really high ISO. I have Canon's 5D Mark III camera, so I can shoot up to around 25600 ISO. It's extremely high. Now the reason we shoot at high ISOs is to minimize the amount of noise that we have in post-production. But counterintuitively, above a certain ISO, most cameras don't give you better noise control this is very counterintuitive. It's called ISO invariance. I've linked to a more technical discussion in the description because it is quite heady trying to figure out why this is the case. But the TLDR is that on most cameras, beyond a certain ISO, the signal to noise ratio doesn't get much better. What that means is if I take two exposures, one at 3200 and one at 25600, so here's the exposure at 25600 ISO. Here's the one at 3200 ISO. Now, if I try to match these two exposures together, this is a difference of three stops. So let me add three here. If we were to zoom in and look at both of these, we would actually see that the noise is no different. If you stare at it long enough, you can maybe hallucinate some differences, but it's just a slightly different pattern. There's really not a lot of difference in the amount of noise between these two images. However, 
we're actually cutting out highlights. Let's try bumping down the exposure on both of these images. I'm going to take this down by three stops and bump the other one back to no exposure compensation. When I compare these two exposures again and zoom in on a very bright object, notice that the one here on the left has a little bit more detail around the edge, whereas this one looks just blown out. The takeaway from that is depending on what camera you have, it may not actually be beneficial to shoot at a high ISO. Now where that threshold is depends on your camera. On the Canon 5D Mark III, with some testing, it looks like ISO 3200 is about as good as you're going to get. Anything higher than that isn't improving noise, it's just decreasing the dynamic range. Some cameras are ISO invariant altogether, which means there's no difference between increasing the exposure on an image shot at ISO 100 versus using an exposure shot at 250, ISO. Your camera probably just has a threshold around there. It might be ISO 400 and above is ISO invariant, or in the case of some of Canon's cameras, probably around 3200 and above. It's just something that you've got to test or maybe go Google and see if someone has done a test out there to figure out what is the highest ISO you should shoot at that will give you good noise control without just clipping the dynamic range. The third newbie mistake to watch out for is what I like to call the uncanny valley of star trails. Now, when you take an image, if you take an exposure shorter than 30 seconds, say a 20 second exposure, the stars will hopefully be pinpoint sharp because your exposure was short enough that the rotation of the earth doesn't cause the exposure of those stars to trail across the image. Anything longer than that and you begin to see these streaks. These streaks can actually look really amazing. They add geometric shapes to the image. If you're pointed towards Polaris in particular, you'll see concentric circles. Unfortunately, there's this huge gap between pinpoint stars and getting incredible star trails. So this image I think is a four minute exposure. And as you can see, the stars have just started to trail and it looks pretty cool, but it's a little bit confusing. These star trails are kind of in the uncanny valley. They're not short enough to be pinpoint, but they're not long enough to look like something other than a mistake. It kind of looks like I just bumped my camera and got a little bit of motion blur here, but everything else in the foreground is quite sharp, so that can't be the case. An exposure that's shorter than say half an hour or an hour long, the star trails are not going to quite be long enough to look like they were intentional. Now, this varies depending on a lot of different things. One, it depends on how much you're zoomed in. So if you're using a wide angle lens, it will take a longer exposure before the trails get very long. If you're pointed directly towards Polaris and oriented with the Earth's axis of rotation, then the entire middle of the photo may display almost no star trailing. Whereas if you're pointed perpendicular, so looking 90 degrees away from Polaris, then the star trails are going to be at their longest. So a lot of different factors affect how long these star trails will be. And if you do an exposure that's say shorter than an hour, those star trails aren't gonna be long enough to look like they were intentional. So I would recommend either try to get your stars pinpoint sharp, which on my camera and my lens has meant shorter than a 20 second exposure, no more than a 30 second exposure, but if you want star trails, you're gonna need some different techniques to get an hour or more of the night sky before those star trails begin to look intentional. That brings us to our fourth newbie mistake to watch out for, and that is doing long exposures. Now, your camera by default typically just does 30 second exposures and no longer. If you want to do a longer exposure, you can use bulb mode. With bulb mode, you can either hold down the shutter as long as you want to keep the shutter open, or you can get a remote shutter release so that way you can start a very long exposure and walk away from the camera. Either way, you can do exposures longer than 30 seconds. Unfortunately, if you do an exposure that long, the sensor begins to heat up. And when the sensor heats up, it begins to get an insane amount of noise. So if you take a peek at this image, this is a 30 minute exposure. It looks like every other pixel is red, green, or blue which means that pixel is completely maxed out. So because the sensor got so hot over a period of 30 minutes, most of this is noise. Moreover, during this entire time, I couldn't see how the image was turning out. And if anything went wrong during the process, if during the shoot, my battery had died, 
I would have been left with nothing to show for it, even if I made it up to 29 minutes before my battery died. So it's very risky to do long exposures because you'll have no results if anything goes wrong in the process. And as you can see, we've got these weird trails here where it seems to have disappeared here and there. That's from clouds going through the image from time to time. There's nothing I can do about this. However, if I had simply taken a long sequence of 30 second exposures and then combined them in post, I could have eliminated just those exposures that had clouds going through the image and I wouldn't have had noise like this. I could have just done, say, 130 second exposures with five seconds in between them, and that would have given the sensor a chance to cool down before starting the next image, and there would have been so much less noise than there is in this particular image. If I bumped my tripod midway through, I could always use the images from the first half and align them with the images that were shot after I bumped my tripod. So it's just so much more forgiving it does take a lot more memory on your computer, of course, but if anything goes wrong during one or two hours doing these star trails, you'll be left with much more to work with and you won't have to deal with unusably noisy images. The last newbie mistake to watch out for is forgetting to take into account other light sources, in particular artificial light sources. So this is that same lighthouse I showed earlier. It's a different perspective. And I came during the day to find an interesting perspective of it. And I thought maybe it, with this coastline and the water coming in from a long exposure, I thought it might be an interesting composition. When I came to shoot it later that night, however, notice that the light from the lighthouse is casting this very harsh shadow on the beach. That shadow completely covered up what I thought was supposed to be interesting in the foreground and also is quite harsh here in the front with that glare. Now obviously you didn't have that during the day because that day it's lit by the sky and the setting sun. So keep in mind whenever you're shooting with a bright light source, whether it be the moon or an artificial light source, Keep in mind that your composition could be completely different because of those shadows which will now be cast by those bright light sources. Those light sources could either give you a really nice surprise in post or it could just completely ruin the shoot altogether. So just make sure to think through where all your artificial light sources are and check and see where the moon will be that night. I hope that helps, but there really is no substitute for getting out there and making these mistakes yourself. So go fire up your favorite weather app and keep your eyes peeled for a clear night. And should you need something to watch while you wait for that one hour star trail shot to finish, make sure to subscribe to the channel to keep up to date with the latest on-location vlogs, digital nomad tips, and landscape photography tutorials.